Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Radical Exchange Students, the Power of Youth. Enjoy. Hello and welcome uh, to the student panel. My name is Jack Henderson. Uh, I'm a researcher and writer. Um, recently graduated from Princeton, uh, where I studied economics under, of all people, Glenn Weil. Um, and while there, I co-founded Radical Exchange Students, uh, which is the youthful arm of the movement and um, has led me to speak on a few campuses about data dignity and quadratic finance. Um, and now I've started working with mainly nonprofit leaders um, to help implement quadratic finance at a city level. Um, and so with that, I will now introduce our wonderful panel. Um, and in making these introductions, I would like to do so um, in the spirit of one of the ideas that have been so important to radical exchange, uh, which is the social nature of, of identity um, and how social identity relates to and even justifies um, the sorts of institutions that we're proposing, um, specifically that our identity is fundamentally social, uh, not individual, that we can't think of ourselves as, you know, self-sovereign, um, but also that there is not one collective that we are all part of. Um, in fact, we're all members or intersections of a wide range of different communities. Um, so I would like to describe each of our panelists um, as, the as the unique intersection that they that they are. Um, so I'll start with Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine was a part of the master's program for international development economics at Yale. Um, she considers herself a, a social data scientist and is interested in data and, and AI and their effects on inequality uh, from an economic and sociological perspective. Um, she's also an artist, both as a musician and singer. Um, and as a designer as well. Uh, so she hopes to serve as, as a bridge um, between scholarship and art, given her sincere interest and activity in both domains. Um, she's sort of the perfect example of the intersection that I'm describing, uh, a really unique combination. Uh, and that's, that's true of all of our guests. Um, our second guest is Christina in Paris. Um, she was born in the rural and agricultural Southwest of Spain um, she is deeply involved now in the critical legal studies movement, uh, has studied in Montreal and in Rio de Janeiro before working at the OECD in Paris. And she's now thinking about the regulation of data and its impact on democratic freedoms and the obstacles that regulations can't solve. Um, and our third guest is Antonio, uh, who's in a bunch of different academic areas at Purdue, including computer science and physics. He's an independent AI researcher and deeply interested in data dignity. Uh, and he's also intertwined with the Catholic community. Um, and so before we turn to questions, I would love for each of you to say a little bit about what brings you to the conversation uh, and your experiences with Radical Exchange. Yeah, let me go ahead, um, since I was also the first to be introduced. Hi um, to everyone. I'm excited to be here. This is um, a first for me as well. And I, I like it because I, I've been wanting to get more involved with Radical Exchange for a while after I first heard about it in a podcast with Glenn Weil, which was actually on the 80,000 hour podcasts. So I came into the community from a different community, which also shows the intersections. And I was excited about it because the movement is so solution oriented. And I've definitely had my times where I was deeply frustrated with economics and finding some researchers who are willing to collaborate with people outside of their field, with art, with um, like-minded community members who maybe have never done research and who present solutions that are actively um, contributing to society that, that we wanna be part of. It's, it's a, not an elitist movement and it has 
bold and controversial ideas, but it's extremely, it's hoping to um, get us to a better place. So this is what excites me and what gets me here, and I'm glad to be here. And I guess it's my turn. So what brought me here was actually uh, my experience in Montreal, because there I met uh, a really good friend, a Brazilian friend. Uh, we were studying together and we shared the same interests because he's a lawyer as me, well, he studied law. And we were both really engaged in the campus life. Uh, he knows, he knew my interest for public policy, for law. Uh, and actually, as I am a law graduate and a political scientist as well, he was the one to introduce me to the movement. And he did it in a, in a way that was really attractive to me because the first thing he told me about was the potential for the academic contributions. And that's why I'm looking for, um, I'm currently finishing my studies in comparative law, but I'm most interested in, in exploring like interdisciplinary ways to understand the way that law is conceived, especially and especially the impact of data in democratic societies. Um, where I was uh, deepening into the student chapter, I realized that this is like radical change give a unique space to scholars. Doesn't matter if you're undergrad or if you are like a PhD student you will have a place to understand and to contribute. And that's why I'm, that's why I'm here. Um, also because I think that it's a, it's a way to exchange as we are doing here uh, with other scholars uh, from different areas of knowledge. And like, that's one of the main, the main interesting things that like attract me here, especially because I'm really focusing in public policy as well as I work in at OECD, um, and there, like, I feel that there are like so many elements and topics that are a part of me or and of my background and my interest that I will really like. I want to keep going with the movement and find like more like other groups in France as I'm living in Paris to engage uh, in more. <laughs> hey everyone, um, my name is Antonio and the way it all started for me, it's kind of um, random. Uh, I was an innocent freshman and I went to a talk by this guy called Jaron Lanier. And I was into VR, so I looked him up, and I was like, oh, uh, this guy explores, explores very um, um, amazing things. Like, he was one of the, of the founders of, of VR, of what we now call VR, which was very different back then. And uh, I went to that talk, and I didn't understand 80% of what he was talking about. <laughs> In fact, I made a question. And it was so bad that he replied to me in three words <laughs> in the middle of a talk. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, this, this, this is not cool. Um, so it took me one year to read all his books. Uh, I read Radical Markets, most of the books in the Radical Exchange reading list. And once I had uh, an idea of everything, I, I understood the bigger, the bigger picture. Um, I, I got involved and uh, I took, I, thanks to Jack and uh, all the Radical Exchange students team, uh, we started something at uh, Purdue and uh, yeah, we're in that process. Thank you all so much. I, th I think you're really the perfect group to have this conversation with. Um, so the things I want to focus on, um, there's obviously some synergy here with around data dignity. Um, that we'll get to, but I'd like to start with, so I guess one of the biggest struggles for me has, has been about inclusion, uh, who's here and who's not here. There are so many ways in which um, all of the excitement and the activity surprises me. 
Um, and yet also so many ways in, in which we have fallen short. Uh, we really don't have many people from rural areas represented or, or from the global south. Um, I say this, of course, in the context of the new the newfound movement for anti-racism. Um, but also, you know, not just like drawing people in to have the right ratios or, or anything like that, um, but, but like in terms of power, uh, can we truly can we truly come together because we have, you know, an urgent shared need that we can solve if we come together? Um, so I, I'd like to hear what you all think in terms of what can we do in our in our language or our activities um, that makes it possible to to bring people closer uh, to the movement, particularly um, students. So I I definitely thought about this um, a lot also because I you know I would have wished that I had learned about this much earlier and I've only uh, heard about it in my master's which is uh, I guess quite late and the three things that I think are more uh, most important are well one just talk about it right kind of like um, Christina told uh, or told her story that it was, it's really sort of random. You just talk to some person, they tell you about it, and all of a sudden you get excited. So I think a lot of getting people to join is, is just talking more about what you do and to dare to talk about it in circles that maybe are a bit unusual. So as you say, um, sure, focusing around students makes sense because it's easy to reach a lot of people. But students in itself is already a population that is not necessarily representative, especially on a university level. So when you think about coming from a rural place, and, and I myself, I'm also from a small town, there's maybe two people from my primary school that are at university. So it's, and I have to say, I don't talk often to my friends from, from then about the things I do now, because I think maybe they're not interested. But I think that's a bias and, and a problem that I that many people have that they don't dare to really share what they're interested in out of fear that it's it's not their thing. That that's not my life from back then. That's my life now. Um, and and lastly, I think it would be really important to to be willing to collaborate with other organizations that have similar values all around the world because it's, it's easier to tap into their network and maybe find champions in um, other countries who, who already know um, the area and the space rather than us coming into, let's say, so I'm, I'm moving to Kenya this fall, but if I just start doing something there, you know, I'm not from there. I don't actually have my networks there yet. So I think collaborating with, with um, local organizations that are already established would be helpful in getting out of our um, out of a bubble that that happens naturally from the people that start a movement yes yeah, so i i totally agree with like justin just said um i was thinking about about the idea of inclusion and our origins and the fact that we are all scholars but we come from different parts of the world um so inclusion of course can be addressed in many ways as as we know um but if we think uh, for example in how can we spread on like the movement and like bring the ideas to to more remote places uh when i mean remote i mean regions the global south more in general but even like small universities in europe in the US, like this is also about inclusion. Like um, inequalities are also geographic, but not only in terms of North and South. And I think that the, the fact of like being here uh, as a student in Paris, uh, studying a master of law, make me a like a person like a, a privilege like from it's a privilege uh, that's what i mean and one of the 
most interesting things of the movement is like to bring like participation and demo and rethink like democratic processes in in a more concrete way in cooperatives in low in the local uh, perspective and in terms of university i think this idea has to be extended um, with an inclusive approach but in many in many ways not only about like origins or race like also about like how do we want like who who are the associate like who are the people we want to talk about i think the answer is like everyone like uh, we and who are like what are the associations that can be like a, a a part of the movement like and if we think that the the um, like the, um, the goal is to like make it like spread the ideas um, in the most powerful way uh we also have to think that in, in that like um from that perspective like uh, for example um well i i was thinking about the like the small university that is in my region uh my where i didn't study but like for them like it would be like almost impossible to like even access to know about this um and this is something that we have to overlap as well um like the most like structural uh inequalities also in the academic world um yeah yeah um so to me um it all comes down to certainty so if you want people to be bold and adopt new ideas kind of be the early adopters of the curve um it's because uh they i mean they're, they're gonna need some certainty right life is uncertain so um and and the way of providing that is by role models right so the reason why i perhaps i'm interested in economics or in physics is because out of people like me previously were interested and very successful in those fields um and and you know those role models are not prevalent of course they are of course minorities still but they are out there um so i think the defining fact is not making role models but uh making them visible um you know, if I know that someone from my region, from my town, with my same background, did something great, uh, then I'm certain I can do it, and that gives me kind of that extra energy to actually um, take action. And um, with that, I think it comes aligning in uh, the, the 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 incentives because if you view it as a zero sum game where you know if if me who I'm Latino gets this job, you who are whatever won't get it, then, um, you know, everything in, like, uh, Jack, an economist would say, like, everything would have, to, the, the, the incentives would have to be aligned for something to work, right? Um, so, unless you get out of the zero-sum game mentality, uh, it won't work. <laughs> Um, so I think that's very important, uh, and that's the what um, Christina and Jasmine said before about like uh, bring people, bringing people closer. Um, and when when people are close, they tend to think uh, they are uh, kind of the, on the same boat, and so their align their incentives are uh, more aligned. And I think that's the way to go. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious what role you think universities specifically have in this struggle for inclusion and if if you think this movement could help address it at all um, we're in a moment in which you know people are looking to every institution including universities uh, for real and, and tangible change um, including addressing historical injustices um, but also people people are rethinking the assumption that the university is always good um, in my experience universities have often normalized uh, inequality for instance, that, that some people belong at universities and, and others do not, um, that some people should go on to get paid a certain amount and others should not. Um, and what you're saying, that, that some people have the opportunity um, to learn about ideas like those of radical exchange and get involved and completely alter their career path, um, and others do not. 
I, I'd like if each of you could speak to your experience with universities, uh, which, which may also be quite different from mine. Um, and if, if you think that plays a role at all in this issue, um, and if you think that the ideas and values of radical exchange um, could help address the problems with the institution. Yes, yeah, so if I can start, like, I think this is about social empowerment. Um, and to add, like, to the idea of role models, I will talk about um, social capital. I mean, this is, like, to me, the way to overlap uh, these obstacles is to make young people feel they they can really like criticize and do something. And the problem is not only this inequality between like uh, institutions, uh, uh, places, countries. Uh, it's also the way that like universities conceive nowadays. For example, like in my case. Uh, I've, stu I've studied this in some of the like in, in good universities in Europe. I could do it because they were public universities and because I have had like scholarships. This this changed everything for me. Um, but also, uh, I like I I I was studying law and I realized that like it's like the way we studied law is just to work as a lawyer and like or to prepare for a public uh, exam that we call like we, we call that uh, to become a judge uh, judge is like this in spain you have to pass like public exam exams um and like to me it was really deceiving like uh if if i like if i had like that impression that i was like being like trained like to be an oper an operative lawyer uh I could, I cannot imagine how how must it be in like more like small universities when you don't have the international asset, you don't have like the the opportunity to go to study abroad like me, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like I think the problem to overlap this is like to to empower young people, uh, and even if like academic academic programs might be like a, I don't know. Uh, they should be rethink in many ways. I think it's this this idea of like making like university something like more idealistic as it was like I don't know decades ago, and like something less um, I don't know uh, <laughs> technical. What is good as well because we go to some university to work or to become an academic. But like I think like. There's a lack of like engagement in general and of like a uh, vivacity, like of energy, like young energy that like really is, is, like make like a struggle like for people, like they don't enjoy university and yeah. If Jasmine, do you want to go? You go first. <laughs> All right. Uh, so my approach to this is that, um, again, the incentives. So I can see this um, with many of my friends back home. Um, their life is very comfortable, even with everything that's happening uh, for many people. Um, and so it's very, it, it, it's very, um, it's not very likely that they will uh, start exploring new ideas and alternative things and and uh, learning uh, because their the, their life is very comfortable, right? So I wanna like um, make like a um, a symbol. So it's like um, when you're in school, right, and um, you're just getting by. Uh, you're not studying much, but you always get by. You always manage to get by. Uh, you won't start really studying until you actually fail. <laughs> Whenever you get home. And that time you didn't get by, that time studying a little bit didn't work um, um, and you failed, then is when you will start studying, right? So I think uh, now we're seeing that a lot of people are failing. Uh, their comfortable lives are not that comfortable anymore. And then is the tipping point where you can support them and make them raise, raise or 
uh, you cannot support them, and then uh, they'll become um, these vultures we're very familiar with in many Western countries, right? Um, so to make another analogy, is like I love soccer, right? And in the Premier League, um, when a team uh, loses the season, they give them extra money. So they'll be the richer teams in the second league. And that means that there's a huge competition uh, because the teams who go down and whose dynamic would be going down uh, is going up again, right? So it's like, that's, and that's what makes it such a competitive league. Uh, so I think it's, it should be something like that. And matching that, um, uh, last year I became aware of these things um, called camp smart campus initiatives that many universities uh, are carrying out with uh, like predictive analytics to like uh, recruit uh, new students and everything. And I found out that the way in which you do that, uh, you could um, um, produce one of uh, the, the two effects. You can either empower the people who have fallen or who are falling, or you can just um, go with the flow and uh, perpetuate the same things that have been there over and over and that you guys were talking about, right? All the inequality, the access to university, the how can I be a public attorney if I have to pay a $200,000 uh, student loan, right? It, it's impossible. <laughs> and um, I think this is uh, very important uh, and this connects with the data dignity part um, as well uh, because um, you can you can like give people incentives to get better instead of um, throwing them to second division kind of thing. That's interesting. Um, I I view this topic very differently to you, so I I, I need to process that information for a little bit. But the way I see it, I the way what you talked about is sort of the speaking economically, the demand side of things, right? You want to give incentives to people so that they are um, more willing to get that knowledge or go to university to be part of that community, if I understood correctly. And I do think what's also very important is just sort of the supply side and the less, um, that's not, so black and white in being a university student and being part of a university. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but let me try to talk practically. I have studied in two very different university systems. I'm from Austria and Europe where universities are very public, very free, and just thereby pretty accessible. But not only to people who actually want a degree, you can sign up and be a university student just for fun for like 10 years and just go to like two classes a semester and just be there and maybe not even write exams or maybe write one exam. It's very flexible. You can go in and out and it's not, um, and you can be part of the university without being a full-time student very easily. And I have found that that gets a lot of people to go outside of their comfort zone and just sort of sign up for a random course and just sit in there um, for fun. So I think that's super useful also for universities to offer talks for free, just have events where the whole community is invited, not just university students. And, and to sort of think more of universities to be an open source resource of, of, of knowledge. I know that in, there's a law in, in Austria um, and also that law is, is printed on some wall in every university. I don't know the exact translation in English, but it's, it says something like universities have to have the responsibility to share their knowledge with, with the world. And, and I think that's very, very critical that it's not to not see universities as this like locked private institutions that you have to work for to get in. Mm -hmm. but to see it as a public institution that creates knowledge and that should be shared. And I, I'm, I think universities could sometimes do better at communicating that knowledge in a language that is more accessible to people, even if they're not at university themselves. Um, 
so that's the, the supply side, but I'm, I'm less certain about how to in, actually encourage people to then consume this knowledge, so to say. Thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to transition now to, it's been hinted at, but I'd like to now talk about um, data dignity. I think there's a lot that we could really get into here since the three of you have, you know, very unique and maybe complementary perspectives on this. You know, Christina from a legal perspective, Jasmine from an economic sociological one, and Antonio from a more technical computer science side. Um, so I'd love for each of you to explain how the ideas and values around data dignity have impacted your, your thinking and, and relate to your work and, and also how it could potentially complement everyone else's work on the subject. Well, I will start. <laughs> so what I found really interesting about the, the concept of data dignity and the measures that the movement proposed is the idea of changing the perspective on what are the problems of big data. Um, I, I, I have, I've been thinking about this like for a long time um, and I was like completely shocked about like the political effects that data have on like uh, modern democracies. Uh, and I'm working on that for my research project. Um, so in my opinion, like data dignity is also about like uh, how data alien uh, alienates uh, societies um, and as I as like in accordance to to the movement I, I agree that data regulation is not only about privacy uh, there are like many other levels in which like data has to be addressed um, I am thinking now about like the like what, what I just say like what like what are the effects of data regulation in, in the health of modern democracies. Uh, and I think like one of the main concerns for me is like the manipulation like of like public information and how like data is used to to like to influence like elections, but not only elections, also like modulate like public debate and everything. And the problem is that there's not a a, like a strict delimitation in the legal sense um, so when like when you are in law school and you talk about data like you normally like talk like in in the like you are talking like from the criminal law perspective or from the like private law and uh, like in like internet law in the private uh, way uh, and I think that data regulation like is really like a matter of constitutional law as well and human rights law uh, and the thing that like in like had like a, a more uh, a big effect on me when I when I was reading like um, like a radical change perspective on on data was this idea of like of like collaborative like a cooperative of citizens like deciding about data and I think like this could be extended in the in the way we think law as citizens, because like the like the 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 the, the way like that information is addressed to us, like really like influence like public decisions and and also like how we perceive like the like over public leaders and everything and i and i've been like i i've i've been really shocked by the impact of like fake news uh, phenomena in my country in spain recently uh from all like from all the ideological sites and i realized that this is an impossible like it's impossible to manage this from the traditional way we think uh in law um and so, so that that's what that's why that that's 
what inspires me the most about like data dignity, um, the, the idea of data dignity uh, in terms of like the, the radical change that has to be done uh, to balance like the like data regulation and social needs and social rights. Yeah, I think that's super interesting what you say about um, regulation and that um, traditional regulation may not be the best way to move forward. Because um, just talking from a tax perspective, for example, in a way, all of this isn't new. I think we started talking about taxing Facebook 10 years ago and, and it still hasn't really happened. So it's clearly very difficult and while I have no idea about the law and, and what makes it so difficult it seems obvious that we need to find a different solution and that's difficult for me because I personally would still think that tax is the easier solution to distribute that profit um, just also from the perspective of making sure the profits go back to or are more are distributed to the people that should get it in a way. So when you decentralize a system or let a market regulate it, which in a way data labor would still be sort of a market structure that isn't necessarily too regulated, it's really crucial to think about how does this actually turn out and who is going to profit from it again. I'm sort of certain that the data labor system will help uh, normal human beings, but then I also always have this global perspective of who produces the data and, and how do you actually distribute the, the profits when, for example, now companies are, are going global and also going to countries where um, people maybe only start to have smartphones and 3G. Now, a tax system could only tax where companies are operating. So they would never actually tax or countries in, in the global south or in, in maybe Southeast Asia and, and Sub-Saharan Africa most likely never be the ones that tax these companies and therefore could never distribute it to their people. And I think this is where the data labor movement is interesting because it will, it goes back to the source of, of the input and doesn't have to go through a tax. I'm just not really sure how it's gonna work out because I also know that coordinating uni unions across borders is incredibly difficult and also needs the law in a way, right? Unions are not just a non-governmental organization. They're also part of a, a legal system. So I'd be curious to hear your perspective on how that tension can be worked out. Should Christina, I? If you wanna, yeah, 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 yeah. If you wanna reply, go, go ahead. I don't know about the law. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, like, I I have the same <laughs> the same questions, but like, what I saw is that like the some of the most radical proposals that have like that are difficult to think like in the context we live now, like are must be seen like as experimental, right? Uh, that see that means that when you like. The problem is that when you regulate, we, you don't see like immediate effects, but also like you need a time like to 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 make it work, right? Uh, and that's the problem with law. Law is always behind uh, society, like and the thing and I, and what I was saying is that there is a really powerful like mm, I don't know potential like there there is a big potential uh, in understanding the like the the problems of law and regulations looking to the world of data but not in a way that 
saying like we have to to know how to work with that 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 is also super interesting but in the sense that what i was saying like like to identify like what are those problems and if we can't answer these questions i think it's also because like there is there is a big problem in balancing like like what is data uh in a more structural way and like how data is like fluctuating in our lives uh like how how could i say like uh over like the like the the sphere of our private life and i i i can't like give you a solution but in terms of law i think like one of the first steps that has to be done like is to understand that criminal law is not enough I'm, taxes are can be effective but like taxes won't like uh, solve like uh, the like the absolute of of the problem because this is like more a, a structural situation that is really new um, and no one really understands and the problem is that if we want to really control like or like have like a, a limitation to the way that data is produced for power like uh, as a as a tool for power or for like for or for politics uh, we have to understand that like politics or power or enterprises won't like altruistically uh, decide for us like to to like Rate, like uh, fix the situation and that's why i think that it's interesting to explore more in like concrete areas like in, the, in an experimental way how might citizens decide over this even if like the, his its effective application is still really far away from us yeah i agree with what you both have said uh, first that the law always goes behind uh, so it won't work for this case and also that taxes do something because obviously they are taxes but they are also highly inefficient uh, if you look at property taxes <laughs> those taxes are are like if you look at from an inefficiency standpoint is like they're horrible <laughs> and that's why there's a huge fraction of the uh, political spectrum that doesn't want them because they are actually inefficient, right? And then we need them, so so we we actually use them. Uh, so the first thing I wanna like, if you wanna fix that, I think it can be hundred percent data dignity. So I think data dignity so is often portrayed as you can have data dignity or you can have advertising, and I think that's wrong. I think I don't think advertising is wrong because advertising. At the end of the day, uh, is means that someone has developed or made something good enough that that person is willing to invest some money in promoting, right? So I think I don't think a world without advertising is 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 a good world. Uh, but right now it's hundred percent advertising and zero percent uh, data dignity. So I think we need to balance that. Um, and yeah, to, to, to give more of the, the, the technical perspective, I think uh, through the traditional channels, many people have tried before, um, Minitel in the beginning of the internet, then I'm, I'm a fan of the Chinadu project, which was intended to be uh, created by, by, by Ted Nelson. It's an amazing story to, to read. Uh, and it, it tried to, to, to create like the ultimate copyright system information tracker. So then you could uh, run micropayments on the system. Uh, and before we had small data and small technology, now we have very good technology, but our data is not big, it's exponential. <laughs> it's, it's impossible to, to control, right? So in my opinion, we get to that trade-off of like, what information should I include? What information should I, should I include? Uh, what should go for advertisers? What should uh, go for me to, to, to make money out of it? And I think, the blockchain space gives a great um, framework for this because the blockchain is never behind like the law and the blockchain if you put the right smart contracts in place is always 
efficient, not 100% efficient, but 90 something percent efficient, like while attacks might be like 40% efficient many times, right? So I think that's a great space and there's a huge community of um, people working on this in the blockchain. Uh, there's uh, this um, organization called the Ocean Protocol, which is an, uh, an internet protocol of, uh, uh, that tries to regulate data sharing and everything, and that will um, work very nicely with uh, what Jasmine said about data unions. Uh, but more of on a blockchain, because uh, if, if unions are on the internet, uh, there's, no, um, pro there's no issue regulating unions in different places, right? Uh, all that bureaucracy, all, that, all those barriers are uh, automatically out of the game. And more of like, to give like a practical approach of like what uh, I've been trying to do with some friends, uh, it's uh, using, um, create like a, a balance system uh, with using like Wolfram language and, and the Mathematica software. Um, and I'm saying this uh, because if people are interested, um, they could join and kind of uh, try to explore the path. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it, it comes, uh, like the important part is valuing data because I cannot sell you something or pay you for something if I don't know its value. <laughs> and that's a huge problem. I think that's what they are working now at Microsoft and everything. Um, um, but yeah, it's a very hard problem. Yeah, it's Thank an you. issue and, and, and that effect on prices as well, right? When you value data, but I think we'll have to move on. Too much to talk about. In this yeah, it's yeah. very interesting. Um, but yeah, unfortunately we only have a, a few minutes left. So I'd love to say something about the, the role of student chapters and young people in the movement. And then Antonio, I know you've been doing some things uh, at the Purdue chapter that I would, I would love for you to briefly speak about. Um, but first, you know, I, I think young people need to be at the heart um, of this movement. Uh, there's a long and prolific history of student activism as a, as a catalyst for social change. Um, and I think we should take inspiration from that. Uh, I, I, I think about the, you know, lunch counter sit-ins uh, critical in the civil rights movement or the students peacefully protesting in Tiananmen Square in 89. Um, or, or today with the countless climate activists um, striking from school over uh, inaction on climate change. And so I, I think it's critical for radical exchange uh, to bring young people into the movement and empower them, um, including, you know, life after university. Um, we, we have a pledge coming out for this year's graduating class to sign um, concerning corporate governance and it's it's quite related to more of the radical antitrust proposals of radical exchange um and, and people you know also have the ability to join groups that are organizing and educating and experimenting with these ideas um but i'd, I'd love to hear from you antonio and, and christina and jasmine if you have anything quickly to add um, just about what you've been doing on your campus and how you feel about uh living in and in a radical exchange inspired life after school. Do you guys want to start? Go ahead, Antonio. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, we are pretty new and our uh, kind of growth um, semester was going to be this semester but instead of the growth semester it's been the COVID-19 semester so that's been an issue <laughs> but um, we're still working on um, um, some in interesting things um, so for example we we so Purdue is not in a big city it's uh, a college town um, which means that everything is close everything is accessible um, so everyone can talk to everyone and that's not like if you live in New York City, right? Well, where you may want to talk to the major, but it's impossible. Uh, we can do it, uh, and that's that's interesting because we're partnering with uh, um, app developing clubs, and we're trying to come up with a very nice quadratic boarding app that we may start implementing uh, in this next semester, this uh, fall semester, because um, we want to try to get everyone at the university or related to it uh, that 
has any kind of voting process uh, to use this app. And this is also gonna give us a lot of uh, feedback um, about how to further improve uh, the system. Um, and it's gonna be in a controlled environment um, wh where everyone, you know, it, there won't be like, any privacy, everything, because we are also part of the ones who contribute, right? So I think that's very interesting. And the more ambitious and long-term um, <laughs> goal is to actually improve the ways in which universities get funding using quadratic funding, because right now, let's say Jasmine is gonna uh, pay $30 million for a new building and put her name up there. There's very low incentive for Christina and I to pay you know, $10,000 for no name. <laughs> um, and that's kind of the same free rider problem that uh, we get into uh, in, in, in other, other parts of, of uh, you know, like the, all the Gitcoin grants. And, and so I think that'd be the long-term goal, but that's, yeah, that's what we're working on right now. Yeah, I think that's really cool with the app. I also think that starting just in a small space is, is really important. And just on the implementation side, wherever you are, try to incorporate those ideas. I will, you know, I'm gonna work for a medium-sized organization, so I might have some leverage to, um, change certain decision processes uh, definitely tell me about that app maybe i can even use it there and so implement ideas on a small scale wherever i can and then also the i think just on the ideas side just constantly talk about things with people that may have never thought about these ideas and get their perspectives and and sometimes you know it's really surprising what ideas people have from other fields from different areas um and that that's really valuable and can contribute to to your own personal development and to the development of the movement yeah so i will i will say the same because like the like my the my experience with the movement have been like online um but still as an academic right so I, I was just thinking about the the fact of that, like we have, we are passing through a pandemic a crisis, and like we we have experienced like so many like new realities uh, on in on interaction, and I think like the this like has like this is like a. I'm 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 feeling like a change of uh, like I don't know of of uh, paradigm in in that sense because like the fact of like well the in in connection with what with what we are doing now is like I think one of the the best things is like the the idea of going beyond uh, over over like area of uh, of knowledge and and over like a typical socializing circle uh, as we are doing here because that's what what led us like uh, like I don't know like ask like different questions in relation with the same topics as we just did like with data dignity and this like uh, idea of remote uh, connection and exchange like from different parts of the world but always talking about the same topics like even like uh, experiencing similar things uh, in different contexts is that what like let us like progress in in less uh, uh, I don't know like unidimensional like uh, uh, way and like spread um, our capacity to to well to to apply our ideas and 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 exchange with others thank you all so much uh, this has been a wonderful conversation and i look forward to uh, working with you and, and hearing about and seeing what you all go on to do so thank you very much thank you thanks, thanks.